Today I'm showing you how to make kabocha squash and make it taste really delicious. If you're new to kabocha squash, here's what you need to know. This is what kabocha squash looks like. It is a winter squash variety, also known as a Japanese pumpkin. And like a pumpkin or a butternut squash, it can be a bit difficult to cut, but in just a minute, I will show you how to easily slice it. Kabocha squash is kind of a crossover between a pumpkin and a sweet potato, at least I think so. It is sweeter than a pumpkin, but less sweet than a sweet potato. It's got this really unique taste, almost like chestnuts. It has this dark green exterior skin, but sometimes you might find it in this variety. It is orange red on the outside. And when you slice it through, it has this really beautiful, vibrant orange color. And when you bake it, kabocha squash has this amazing, almost velvety texture. I think velvety is the right word. You can sometimes find kabocha squash year round, but its peak season is right now, late summer through the fall. You can find it at farmer's markets, as well as a lot of different grocery stores are carrying it these days. And like all winter squash, it is packed with nutrients, especially fiber and vitamin A. And now let's talk about how to cut this thing. First things first, you need a sharp knife. Very dangerous, sharp knife. And secondly, you need a little bit of upper body strength. Just remember you gotta put a little bit of core into it. One trick that really works is to slice off a thin layer on the top and the bottom of the kabocha squash. That way it's a lot easier for your knife to pierce the flesh, which is a lot softer than the skin. The key is to use a slow, steady rocking motion with your knife to cut the kabocha squash in half. Like this one's a bit of a toughie. All right, this requires some uh, upper body strength. It got a good, good slice in there. So I'm gonna take it down. And who doesn't like feeling like they've accomplished something? If you're still having trouble cutting it, you can just pop the whole kabocha squash like this into a microwave for one to two minutes. It'll soften up the flesh and make it easier to slice through. Now it's time to scoop out the insides. Take a spoon and just scoop out all this gunk in the inside. You can reserve the seeds and bake them like you would pumpkin seeds. Just be sure to give them a rinse and dry them off. Another thing I love about kabocha squash is you don't have to peel this. This peel is edible. I personally love the taste of it. If you cook it with the skin on, you will find that it's much easier to remove the skin afterwards. And now for a simple side dish that I like to use for meal prep, I just cut the kabocha squash in half, then cut each half into similarly sized wedges. I put them on a parchment paper lined baking sheet. I line mine with parchment paper for easy cleanup and brush the wedges with a little bit of olive oil or avocado oil and add some salt and pepper. You can bake them like this, or I like to add some fresh thyme sprigs and garlic cloves for a little extra flavor. Bake the wedges in an oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 to 35 minutes. The wedges should be soft and tender on the inside, but a little bit crunchy and browned on the outside. If you wanna do minimal chopping, just cut the kabocha squash in half and then brush each side of the flesh with a little bit of olive oil or avocado oil, salt and pepper, and then place them flesh side down on a parchment paper lined baking tray and bake at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for about 45 to 60 minutes, maybe even more if you have a large kabocha squash. And then you can just scoop out the flesh at the end. This is a great preparation method if you want to puree the flesh for a homemade pumpkin puree alternative or like we're going to do in this next recipe for a kabocha squash curry. I love a good curry and this Thai inspired creamy kabocha squash curry is my new favorite. Once you've roasted the kabocha squash halves, you'll scoop out the flesh and puree it in a blender with a little bit of water. When you roast kabocha squash and puree it, it gets so creamy, we're going to add it directly to the curry to thicken it up naturally. Every good curry starts off with sauteing some aromatics, and today we have onions, carrots, garlic, ginger, and Thai chili peppers. You want to dice the onions and carrots very finely so that they almost melt into the background of the curry. And if you're sensitive to spicy food, you can omit the chili peppers or use a less spicy pepper such as a jalapeno. Saute the onions and carrots in a bit of coconut oil and cook them down until they're really soft and season with a little bit of salt and pepper along the way to build flavor. Once they're softened, you'll add the minced garlic, ginger, and chili pepper along with some red curry paste. Thai Kitchen is my favorite brand for curry paste, but just keep in mind that each brand has a slightly different level of heat. Next, you'll pour in the kabocha squash puree, and as you can see, it will nicely thicken the curry, followed by some reduced fat coconut milk for extra creaminess. We're also adding some turmeric for its anti-inflammatory antioxidant properties, tamari or soy sauce for saltiness, maple syrup for a little bit of sweetness to balance out the spiciness, and chickpeas for protein. Bring this mixture to a boil and then reduce to a simmer. I also add some miso paste for more umami, but if you don't have any, you could just add more salt. 
Simmer for 15 to 20 minutes until it's really thick and creamy. And I like to finish it with a few squeezes of lime juice to freshen it up and balance all of the flavors, as well as some chopped cilantro. Now for our gluten-free kabocha squash banana bread. You'll start by making the kabocha squash puree. You'll need to bake about one small kabocha squash or one extra large half using the method I described earlier, and then puree the flesh in a food processor until it's really smooth. To ensure the banana bread isn't watery, strain the puree over a fine mesh sieve to remove any excess liquid. You want to ensure you're using really ripe spotted bananas for banana bread. That's when they're the sweetest and easiest to mash. Add the kabocha squash puree to the mashed bananas, along with some almond milk or other plant-based milk, avocado oil, coconut sugar, and vanilla extract. Whisk that all together, and it's okay if there's still some banana chunks left. Now you'll sift together some gluten-free all-purpose flour and almond flour. I like this combination for tender, gluten-free baked goods, and sifting ensures an even texture and even distribution of ingredients. Add some baking soda and baking powder, sea salt, and some pumpkin spices. I love grating whole nutmeg using a microplane because it's super flavorful, but if you don't have it, you can use ground nutmeg. Mix the dry ingredients together to ensure they're evenly incorporated, then use a wooden spoon to gently stir the dry ingredients into the wet, taking care to not overmix because overmixing can cause your bread to be dry, dense, or unevenly baked. Pour the batter into a greased or lined loaf pan and smooth it out. I'm finishing it with this really delicious cinnamon walnut streusel on top. It is optional, but it's also really good, so I highly recommend it. You can find the full recipe for it in the blog post. Bake the loaf in an oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit until it's fully cooked through. I know it's difficult to wait, but try to wait until it's cool to slice it up and then it's ready to be enjoyed. Now that we've covered kabocha squash, let's get back to basics with some pumpkin recipes. I made a little playlist for you to watch, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with your friends and family, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Okay, bye!